the idea of Gestalt therapy is to change paper people into real people. I know it's a big mouthful. And to make the hollow men of our time come to life and teach him to use his inborn potential and being, let's say, a leader without a rebel, having a center instead of living lopsided. All these ideas sound very demanding, but I believe it's now possible that we can do it, that we don't have to lie on the couch for years, decades, and centuries without essential changes. The condition under which this can be achieved is this. Again, I have to jump back and talk about the social milieu in which we find ourselves. In the previous decades, he lived for what is right. And he did his job, never mind whether he really wanted the job, whether he was suited for it. The whole society was ruled and regulated by shouldism, by puritanism. You do your thing whether you like it or not. Now, I believe the whole social milieu has changed. Puritanism has changed into hedonism. We begin to live for fun, enjoyment, for being turned on. Anything goes as long it's nice. It sounds good too sounds superior to moralism. It has, however, a very serious setback. Namely, that we have become phobic towards pain and suffering. Let me repeat that word. We have become phobic towards pain and suffering. Anything that's not fun or pleasant is to be avoided. So we run away from any frustration that might be painful and try to shortcut it. And the result is a lack of growth. When I talk about the readiness to encounter unpleasantness, I certainly do not mean an education towards masochism, on the contrary. A masochist is a person who is afraid of pain and trains himself to tolerate it. I'm talking about the suffering that goes along with growing up. I'm talking about facing honestly unpleasant situations and this is very much linked up with the Gestalt approach. I don't want to talk too much about the phenomenon of Gestalt. However, the main idea about Gestalt is that the Gestalt is a whole, a complete in itself resting whole. As soon as we cut up a gestalt, we have bits and pieces and not a whole anymore. I mean, a gestalt wants to be completed. If the gestalt is not completed, 
we are left with unfinished situations. In this unfinished situation, press and press and press and want to be completed. Let's say, if you had a fight, you really are angry with that guy, want to take revenge. This need for revenge will nag and nag and nag until you have become even with him. And so there are a thousand unfinished Gestalten. How to get hold of this Gestalt is very simple. This Gestalt will emerge. They will come to the surface. Always the most important Gestalt will emerge first. We don't have to dig a la Freud into the deepest unconscious. We have to become aware of the obvious. If we understand the obvious, everything is there. And the neurotic is the person who doesn't see the obvious. So what we're trying to do in Gestalt therapy is to understand the word now, the present, the awareness, and see what happens in the now. And to understand the now will take you anything from four weeks to 20 years. The second point I have to make in regard to our therapy is the word how. In previous centuries, we asked why. We tried to find causes, reasons, excuses, rationalizations, and we thought if we can change the causes, we can change the effect. In our electronic age, we don't ask why anymore, we ask how. We investigate the structure. And if we understand the structure, then we can change the structure. And the structure with which we are most interested in is the structure of our life script. The structure of our life script, often called karma, fate, and we are not very much aware that we are writing our life script. A life script which is mostly taken up with self-torture, futile self-improvement games, achievements, and so on. So what we want to do is to reorganize our life script. And the means and ways to do it can be understood to quite an extent. Right now, interested in meeting some of you, and I have to admit, I have a very bad memory for names. And I have to know a person pretty well or have a shock or great joy when I meet this person so that I can recall the names. In order to work, I like and I brag about the six components of my work. To work, I need my skill, the so-called hot seat, which in this case is very beautiful. <laughs> the empty chair, which has the task of taking up roles which we have disowned, other people which we need to understand our life script. 
We need something that is absent. I hope maybe today we don't need it. That is Kleenex, my cigarettes, the ashtray, and then I'm in business. <laughs> So, I invite anyone who wants to come forth and work with me to take the hot seat. Your name is? Don. Don. I have only one request to make to you to use the word now, if possible, with every sentence. Like, now I feel my heart beating? Yeah. Um, and now I wonder why I'm sitting here. <laughs> um, why did I wish to fill the void. Um, now I'm wondering, what is there to work with? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Let me interrupt you here and switch back to Freud in his psychoanalysis. Freud said, a person who is free from guilt feelings and anxiety is healthy. My own theory about anxiety and guilt are those. Guilt, as I hope to show in its context, is nothing but unexpressed resentment. And anxiety is nothing but the gap between the now and the later. As soon you leave the secure basis of the now and jump into the future, you experience anxiety, or in this case, stage fright. You get excited, the heart begins to race, and so on and so on. All the symptoms of stage fright. The fact that we very often don't notice our chronic anxiety is simply that we fill the gap of the now and later with insurance policies, rigid character formations, um, daydreams, and so on. If we reduce the later to the now, the anxiety is bound to collapse. So, let's do this now. Close your eyes and tell us in detail what do you experience now. Well, physically I feel the warmth of one hand and another. I feel, um, now I feel uh, tension throughout my body, Can you especially enter up here. Right. Can you enter this tension? It's can as if I'm being stretched this way across can, my Can you do this to me? Oh. Stretch me. as if I pull it up this way more. Do it as much as you need to. <laughs> okay, sit down. Something like that. Now it's gone away. Yeah. <laughs> if you learn to do unto others what you're doing unto yourself, 
<laughs> you stop repressing yourself and, and preventing yourself from what you've got to do. I don't understand yet his need to stretch me. <laughs> to talk about it would be... And here I have to shock you, because I have to introduce one of the technical terms in the start therapy, which is mind fucking. <laughs> the very moment we just play these intellectual games, like they do usually in group therapy, they throw opinion on each other, explanations, people interpret each other. So nothing happens except these intellectual world games. So what do you experience now, Tom? Um, my own mind fucking. <laughs> <laughs> Explaining to myself why I would want to stretch you. Okay, let's introduce the empty chair. Ask Don this question. Um, <clears throat> Don, why do you want to stretch yourself or another person? Now, change seats. And this is the decisive phrase. Start to write your script now, between the two opponents. Well, Don, you're not good enough the way you are. So you've got to stretch. Um. Yeah, that's quite possible. Um. One never knows what one's potentials are, unless one does stretch. Um, I agree. I should stretch. Uh, yes. Um, um, you seem to have got the message. And all, all you have to do now is do something about it. Um, yeah, I do try to do something about it um, sometimes. Uh, I'm constantly aware that I am supposed to do something about it. I don't always do something about it, once in a while. Yeah. We make now the first acquaintance with one of the most frequent splits in the human personality. That is the top dog underdog split. The top dog, known in psychoanalysis as the superego or the conscience. Unfortunately, Freud left out the underdog. And he did not realize that usually the underdog wins in the conflict between top dog and underdog. I give you the frequent characteristics of both. The top dog is righteous, sometimes right, but always righteous. He takes it for granted that this top dog that tells him he's so to stretch and to improve, that the top dog is correct. The top dog always says you should, and the top dog threatens, if not then. However, the top dog is pretty straightforward. Now, the underdog works with a different method. The underdog says, yeah, or oh, I promise. Why oh, agree? <laughs> oh, <Maliana. laughs> if I only could. So, the underdog is a very good frustrator. And then the top dog, of course, don't let it get away with it. It increases <laughs> the use of the rod. And so the self-torture game or self-improvement game, whatever you want to call it, goes on year in, year out, and year in, year out, and nothing ever happens. Right? Not quite, but... <laughs> <laughs> the, dog, the top, dog, top dog keeps pushing. Yeah. And uh, um, he gets... Say this to the top dog. 
Um, yeah, you keep pushing, and uh, sometimes I give you something. Uh, I often feel it isn't adequate enough for your, doesn't quite meet your demands. Mm -hmm. So be the talk talk in demand. What in your demand? You should. I, you should get much more organized, and uh, you could be far more intelligent about how you go about things than you are right now. Okay. And, uh, now, again, be do unto others what you do unto yourself. Say the same sentence to these people here. You should get better organized. Yeah, Bill, if you want to improve, you should get much better organized and make much more use of your time and energy. And you should get much more organized and be more intelligent about how you go about things. And you go a lot further. Now, uh, Gail, uh, you can do the same. <laughs> Has your teeth. How do you feel in that role when you say this to others and not to yourself? I, I feel that um, they can tell me to go to hell. They okay, tell them to go to hell. You keep on nagging and then each one tells you to go to hell. <laughs> go to hell. <laughs> Haven't I told you often enough <laughs> that you should work harder? <laughs> yeah, as a matter of fact, you have. <laughs> And can't you work harder? Can't you organize yourself better? I don't want to, thank you, Don Bethel. <laughs> How about you, Bill? I mean, you could have, you could go much further if you organized yourself better. You could be a wealthy man now. <laughs> be a fantastically successful business if you organize yourself and work harder with your talents. Okay, how do you feel now? I feel like a very soft righteous. <laughs> <laughs> How's your stage fright? Oh, it's sort of gone away. Yeah. But this being self-righteous is part of your life script. <coughs> and uh, so you need a lot of people you can be self-righteous with. 